Okay, let's start. Uh, welcome to another lecture from Web Services. Today, we are going to talk about UDDI, uh, which uh, you can view as a catalog of web services. Uh, this catalog will be usable both by humans and uh, by machines um, in order to uh, discover web services and discover how to communicate with the web services uh, registered in the catalog. So uh, just to recap, we already talked about W3C style web services, which use SOAP typically as a uh, messaging protocol. SOAP is based on XML and typically contains headers and in body. And the headers provide an extension mechanism and that uh, we can use to add functionality to the W3C style web services ecosystem. So we have seen, for instance, web services security as one of the possible extensions that can use SOAP headers to add some functionality, such as encryption, uh, ensuring confid uh, confidentiality, um, uh, and so on. Uh, we also talked about Wizzle, which is the machine readable uh, way of describing a web service interface. Um, we have also seen how Wizzle can be extended by uh, the specifications such as web services policies. So we can say that, for instance, a web service described by a Wizzle file needs to implement web services uh, security and needs to receive only encrypted messages and stuff like that. So that can go into a Wizzle file. Now, today we are going to talk about UDDI. It is a specification uh, published by Oasis, which is a group of uh, companies basically, or a consortium, uh, which is the second biggest contributor to the specifications of W3C style web services. It has uh, multiple versions. Version 1.0 is already uh, deprecated. Versions two and three, uh, still are used sometimes, we are going to talk about version three. And um, as I already mentioned, UDDI represents basically a catalog of web services. So it can be used to publish information about web services, retrieve information about web services. And uh, of course you can manage the information in the catalog. The scenarios for usage of uh, such a catalog of web services are quite straightforward. Um, the important thing here is that uh, the use cases can be done both in design time. So when you are setting up your web services, you can register them in the catalog and then you can, as a human being, uh, use that catalog to uh, find web services that you need to implement your functionality. So that's the design time. But what you can also do is you can use UDDI in uh, runtime, which means that your code can actually in runtime uh, query the UDDI registry to find suitable web services, find uh, how to call those web services or invoke them and actually invoke them uh, all in runtime, which allows us to, uh, for instance, create a scalable web services where you can register multiple instances of the same web service in the UDDI registry and uh, other uh, web service clients, for instance, can find all those instances there, and uh, they can use them in a dynamic way uh, in, in runtime. Um, of course, you can search for web services, for instance, using keywords. Um, and in the UDDI registry itself, you can cache some technical information you need uh, to actually access the uh, web services. A typical overview of how the UDDI ecosystem works uh, is um, typically um, illustrated like this. So we have the UDDI registry, the catalog. You have your web, web services server, which is registered in the UDDI registry. Then you have a client which searches the registry for uh, web services they need. And when they find them, they invoke them. So they use them based on the information found in uh, that registry. So now, Let's take a look at what is actually in that UDDI registry. 
And there are four basic types of things that you can find there. Um, there are business entities. Those have basically nothing to do with web services. Those are really businesses, information about their name, description, uh, maybe a location of that business, location of their headquarters and so on. So really this is just a catalog of companies. So those are the business entities. Those companies typically provide some business services. So this is a description of what they do. So do they um, do business in transportation or uh, are they a medical company or something like that? Uh, and those business services can be, uh, for instance, uh, providing transportation or something like that. But here, yeah, actually, we presume that those business services will be in the end implemented as web services so uh, an example of, uh, um, let's have a look uh, at an example from the university environment. So the business entity can be the Charles University, for instance, the business service can be uh, manage your schedule or uh, something like that, uh, manage uh, student theses and so on. So those are business services and those business services can be actually implemented as web services, and those are described as binding templates. So we have uh, businesses, then business services, and then binding templates. The binding templates are the representations of the actual web services. And uh, aside from this hierarchy, this, this forms a hierarchy because a binding template always implements a specific business service, and the business service is always done by uh, a business entity. Um, but aside from uh, this hierarchy, we have uh, something called a T model. That's a technical model. And that's basically an identifier of some concept, uh, such as uh, the SOAP protocol, the HTTP protocol, and so on. So you can say that, for instance, your web service represented by the binding template in UDDI implements SOAP by connecting it to a T model which represents the SOAP protocol. We'll see specific examples in a moment. This is just to give you an overview. So we have, again, business entities, the businesses themselves, their business services, what they do, and then binding templates, which are the web services implementing the business services. And the web services are typically uh, characterized using a set of T models. Uh, aside from, uh, from these basic, things in UDDI, and uh, there are also other things such as publisher assertion. That's an assertion is basically a statement. Uh, and what you, can, uh, what you can say in the UDDI registry, for instance, is that one company is a child company of another company. So again, nothing to do with the technical part of uh, web services. But when you use UDDI as a registry of businesses that you collaborate with, for instance, then this might, be, uh, this might be useful. And also in UDDI, you have subscriptions. You can subscribe to the registry to be notified about changes. So for instance, you want to be notified that a business registered a new business service or something like that. So those are subscriptions. Now, something that all the entities registered in UDDI have in common um, is how they are identified within that registry and they are identified using keys. So keys are really key in, uh, in UDDI. Everything, every business entity, every business service, every binding template, every T model, everything is identified using keys. Those keys are URIs. In UDDI version two, the key looked like uh, UDDI and then some random uh, string. Um, what we will see um, in our tutorials and in this lecture is UDDI version three key, which is based on domain name URIs. So uh, a key is a URI with the UDDI scheme and then some, um, some structure after that. The structure of the UDDI URI is actually uh, determined using, using semicolons and each part uh, delimited by a semicolon is called a partition or a key partition. So we have keys, which are URIs, and the keys have partitions. That's uh, what we'll need to know uh, from, from now on. 
Now, the focus of uh, the UDDI registry is uh, not only on the technical description of a web service. Uh, UDDI also focuses on um, classification of everything. So every business entity, business service, or uh, a binding template can have a set of um, classifications attached. So for instance, um, a business uh, entity can have uh, a type of department attached and the type of department is a classification which may contain um, types like uh, accounting, HR, management, and so on. Um, so basically it's a code list and you can use this code list to classify everything in EDI. So that's a taxonomic classification. Um, you can have multiple of those attached to each thing in UDDI. Um, and uh, in general, those, uh, those classifications are called value sets, uh, which is, a, again, a separate entity in UDDI. And you can have services attached to value sets, which provide, for instance, validation that the used uh, code list item is actually part of the code list or not. So that's um, uh, a property of that value set, uh, which is checked or unchecked. Checked means that there is a service attached that validates uh, the values. Unchecked means that uh, you can use any value you want in that classification, for instance. Another focus of UDDI, besides categorization or classification of everything, is um, internationalization. Um, the universal in the UDDI acronym stands for uh, well, universal description, but the meaning of universal means uh, worldwide here, basically. So uh, this means that the businesses that are registered in UDDI, uh, they have, uh, uh, or th there is a support for businesses that span multiple time zones, that have addresses in, uh, well, I mean, postal addresses in different formats uh, and so on. And also when you have support for all this, um, you also need to focus on how you can search those entities, based, for instance, using their names when uh, they are represented in Unicode. So Unicode is a character encoding, which allows you to basically represent any character from any reasonable alphabet used on the web. Uh, that's fine. But um, using Unicode for searching presents some unique challenges. One specific challenge is that uh, one character in Unicode that uh, looks, uh, well, this applies for instance for Czech characters, which from the Unicode point of view, they consist sometimes of the basic character and then some diacritics. Uh, and there are various ways in, in Unicode how to represent a single character um, on, on the byte level. So you can have various byte sequences, which are all valid Unicode characters representing a, the same character. And this is a problem when searching because uh, when you use another uh, byte sequence um, representing the character you are searching for, and in the data you have yet another byte sequence representing the same character, you will not find it. This is a problem uh, for those international settings. And therefore uh, the UDDI specification mandates the usage of Unicode normalization form C. Now this uh, might be uh, quite a complex term, but remember last time when we talked about um, digitally signing XML documents, there we actually dealt with something similar because in XML, you can have various white spaces, you can have uh, differently defined namespaces and so on. And uh, regardless of how you choose your white spaces or namespaces, the XML content means the same thing. But on the character level, when you try to uh, digitally sign the content, you will end up with uh, various hashes due to this. And in XML, we used XML canonicalization to uh, deal with uh, those differences. And uh, the Unicode normalization form C is the same technique for uh, the Unicode characters. Basically, it tells you <clears throat> how the characters that look like uh, uh, look the same which one of their representations is the normalized one. And that is specified by the Unicode normalization form C. Uh, and uh, thanks to that, 
uh, you can safely search um, using Unicode strings in, uh, in UDDI. Now, the support for different types of addresses, because in the world, the postal addresses all have different formats, is basically done by abstracting from all the details. And therefore, uh, the addresses um, are composed of address lines, and that's it. So uh, this is applicable to basically any type of address that you may find in the world. Of course, the specification is not very precise, but at least it is uh, uniform. So you know that simply an address consists of address lines and you can rely on that. So this is the focus of UDDI on internationalization. And uh, the other focus was on classifying all the registered entities. Now let's take a closer look on the individual things that you may find in a UDDA registry. And we'll start from the top. So the first thing that you may find in a UDDA registry is a business entity. Now <clears throat> the business entities in a UDDI registry are sometimes called white pages. This is for historical reasons, because if you remember that a couple of well decades ago, uh, when we had phone books, those phone books, like the paper phone books, were divided in different color sections. And uh, the, white, uh, the white pages contained businesses according to their names. Uh, so this is basically what the business entities in UDDI represent. Those are the businesses, nothing technical. So about each business, we have uh, its name, its uh, contact information, description, and so on. And uh, among all those things that we can have about a business entity, uh, we have uh, business services, which is the container for uh, what, they, what the business actually do. Those are the business services, which we'll take a look at uh, next. But before we do that, uh, let me point to this category bag. A bag is another word for a set. So this is a set of categories assigned to that business service, uh, business entity, sorry. Um, so this is the support from UDDI to categorize everything. Everything in UDDI can have a category bag attached, which we'll see um, in, in a moment. And for a business, there is also a discovery URL, which is basically any URL, which can get you more information about the business. And, um, Let's have a look at a specific example. So this is how a uh, business entity is registered in UDDI. Again, UDDI uses XML, of course. Um, there is a namespace for UDDI that is used uh, for, for every XML element um, in UDDI. And what we can see here, well, there is uh, the key here, which is the identifier of this business entity within the UDDI registry. Uh, you can see that it has the, uh, it has the uh, sections here uh, delimited by the semicolons. Then there is the discovery URLs. We can see that this one is a homepage. Then there is a name. Note the usage of the external lang attribute for determination of uh, which language is used in this XML, uh, in this representation of the company name. There is description. Uh, the business services are empty here, but we will get to those in a moment. And then there is the category bag. Now, the this keyed reference is actually the reference to a specific uh, categorization scheme, um, which is again, uh, well, we will get to the fact that each category is actually a T model uh, in, in terms of UDDI. But what is important is that uh, the, the category is represented again by a key because everything in UDDI is represented by a key. So uh, the categorization here is uh, uh, that it is a node here. Um, so this is the key of, uh, of the uh, categorization scheme and the key value is the value within that scheme. So this says that according to this categorization, the business entity is, is a node here. That's because um, this business entity actually represents an instance of a uh, UDDI registry that we work with in the tutorials. It is called Apache uh, Judy. 
And uh, yeah, we all work with that one uh, into tutorials. And when you spin that up, uh, the, um, the instance itself gets registered within itself as a business entity. And this is uh, the example. So next we have the business service. That's what the business entity does on the business level. So again, nothing technical. And this is also called or referred to as the yellow pages, because again, for historical reasons, in those old uh, phone books, there was a yellow pages section where the businesses were basically listed according to what they do, according to their business services. So that's why this is called yellow pages. And here we have a business service. Uh, it has a name, description, uh, again, a category bag. So again, a business service can be classified using various classifications. And there is a container for binding templates. Those are or will be the actual web services implementing this, uh, this business service. Um, so this also means that one business service can be implemented as a set of web services. For instance, a purchase order web service um, can be a business service and it can contain multiple actual web services such as uh, submission, confirmation, notification, and so on, all regarding to purchase order processing. An example in XML looks like this. So again, we have, uh, we have the name of uh, the business service. Here, we can see that uh, the calculator is used. This is the calculator that we worked with um, in the tutorials, and we will work with it again in the UDDI tutorial. Um, so here we have, um, the, it is a business service. It allows us to calculate stuff. And uh, what we can see here is uh, the service key, which is the key identifying this business service. Then we can see the business key, which is the key of the business to which this service belongs to, uh, or which runs this service. Then we have a name, a description, and again, a category bag classifying this particular business service. Here, uh, we can see three categorizations. One says that it is a whistler service. One says that the name uh, of that whistler service is calculator. And one says that uh, the XML namespace used by the web service is this one. And we know this one from, from the tutorials. So this is how a uh, business service can look like. And uh, this leaves us with the binding template. The binding template actually describes a web service. It is also called a green pages for historical reasons. That's because, and this is not known from Czech phone books, but uh, probably from American phone books where uh, green pages, or maybe not even phone books, but green pages are technical manuals. So here, uh, the binding template is already a technical thing. And uh, here, one business service can be implemented by multiple uh, web services represented as binding templates. Every binding template needs to have an access point, which has a use type. It may be an actual endpoint where you can send messages to the web service, or it can uh, say that uh, the web service is deployed as a whistle deployment, and then uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have to find a whistle file which describes where the service actually lives, um, which is the most common uh, type of, uh, of uh, binding template. An example of such a binding template again. So again, uh, the binding has a key. This is the identifier of the binding template. It belongs to a business service, again, identified by a service key, and it has a description and the access point. In this case, the access point is of the endpoint type. So it really is the URL of the um, service where you can send, uh, send messages. And uh, there is a category bag saying that this, uh, uh, this binding template is the whistle deployment type. And in between, we have T model instance details. Those are links to the actual T models characterizing the binding template. Uh, and here we can see various, uh, various T models. Uh, one says that the web service uses HTTP. Another says that the web, services, uh, web service uses SOAP. 
Um, yet another says uh, something about uh, the post type used in Whistle, and, uh, and the, uh, this one is the identification of the binding in that Whistle file. What is important here is that uh, this uh, set of T models actually creates something called a uh, technical um, um, Okay, I will get to the term later. Uh, it is um, technical fingerprint or something like that. Basically, the, the set of T models represents the web service type. And when you have two web services with the same uh, set of T models, then they are considered uh, that they do the same thing and uh, you can uh, use them um, like they were implementing one, one, one web service. So. If you spin up, for instance, multiple instances of a web service doing one thing, it, um, it is desirable that uh, all those web services uh, have the same set of T models so that they can be found using those T models. Uh, right, this brings us to uh, the T models themselves. So they are nothing more than basically an identification of some technical concepts, such as the SOAP protocol, or HTTP protocol. Uh, the function here is that the T model representing, for instance, HTTP protocol has a key, and you can use that key to search for all web services accessible using HTTP, or you can search for all services accessible using SOAP, and so on. Um, so they really characterize the web service from the technical point of view. Um, right. Now, an example of a T model. Uh, so again, T, uh, each T model has a key. This one represents the HTTP protocol. Um, it is a name, a description, and then uh, a T model typically contains a link to a human readable document that tells you something about that technical um, uh, specification for that T model. So here, HTTP has a, an overview document, which is um, from the UDDI web server, uh, which says or describes that uh, what it means for a web service to be accessible using uh, HTTP. Uh, and uh, there is a categorization saying that this T model is from uh, the types categorization and it is a transport type. Um, Right, uh, so um, we already know that the T model name is a key, it's a, it's a URI. Um, the set of technical models, T models, is a technical fingerprint of that web service. So if you can see that the web service implements the same port type, same binding, uh, SOAP and HTTP, uh, then you know that all those services that you can find using this fingerprint uh, implement the same thing. Another use case for T models is um, that they can modify search functionality um, when using UDDI. So for instance, uh, you can say that uh, you want to sort your search results by using the T model representing a sort order uh, or something like that. Um, we have already seen T models used for representation of various transport protocols. Um, Another use case for T models that we have already seen is for the categorization. So each categorization and each item in this categorization is a T model. Uh, here we can see a uh, find qualifier T model. So this one is the one that can modify your search results. So imagine that you are searching for a web service, for instance, using its name in a UDDI registry. You can say, that uh, your search will be uh, or should be an approximate match. So not an exact match, but an approximate match. Um, in that case, you use this, uh, this T model. But if you take a look at that T model, you will see that the T model has, of course, again, a category bag. And one of those categories can be that, um, that uh, in the types categorization, which is one of the standard categorizations present 
directly in the UDDI specification. So in that types categorization, it is of the find qualifier uh, category because it modifies uh, the search functionality here. Yep, so uh, this is again a reference to another T model. So one T model can be categorized by another, uh, another T model. Um, speaking of the types uh, categorization in UDDI, uh, here is an overview of what, is, uh, what can be found in that categorization. Some of those types we have already seen. So we have seen the transport type, we have seen the checked and unchecked type, and uh, we have seen the whistle deployment type. Uh, and uh, now, actually a little bit later, we will talk about the key generator type, uh, which can be seen here. And we have seen also the find qualifier type. So these are the basic types uh, of, uh, of T models that you can find in, uh, in DDI. Um, one more thing that can be found there uh, is uh, the publisher assertion. And here we have an example saying that we have basically two companies and they are in the parent-child relationship. So this is a simple fact that you can also record in a UDDI registry. Right, so this was an overview of what you can find uh, in the UDDI registry and how the data looks like. Now we need to talk about how you can actually use that registry to find something, find something or register something. All the functionality of the UDEI registry is implemented again as a set of W3C style web services. Each of those web services is described by a uh, whistle. Um, each of those web services is therefore a port type. And um, there are the services that you would expect from a catalog. So there is a publishing uh, web service, which you can use to actually enter information into the catalog. Then there is an inquiry web service that you can use to search for information in that catalog. Um, but then there are also some uh, web services that you would maybe not expect to see there, um, such as uh, the subscription web services, where you can subscribe to updates in that catalog. Uh, there are web services that have to do with uh, validation of value sets, such as categories and so on. Um, then uh, there is replication and custody transfer. We will get to that. Uh, that has to do with uh, the fact that uh, UDDI registry is not uh, only one node. It can be a whole set of nodes uh, interconnected. And therefore, uh, you need to sometimes move some registered items from one registry to another. Um, right, so uh, let's have a closer look at some of those APIs. So let's have a look at the inquiry API. And here um, you can find the expected, uh, the expected functionality. So you can find businesses, services, bindings, and key models. You can also find related businesses based on some publisher assertions. Then uh, when you find those, you can get details about each of those. So again, you can get details about a binding, a business a service, or a T model. Um, and uh, when searching, you can use the find qualifiers, which are the special kind of T models that we have seen. Uh, we have seen the approximate match here. Um, you can also modify your search by uh, saying that it should be case sensitive, case insensitive, diacritic sensitive, insensitive. Um, it needs to be signed the result and so on. And then you can modify the search uh, saying that it needs to be sorted uh, according to name or date, ascending, descending, and so on. Um, an example of uh, such a request to the API, well, again, it is a salt message because the API is implemented as a W3C style web service. So um, yeah, we basically say that we want to find a service based on its name in English and the uh, name should be calculator. Um, and the response contains two parts. One is the list of the found services and one uh, has some statistics about uh, how many services or results in general were found. Now here, 
we can see that based on the calculator query, we actually find a service named calculator. Um, but that's it. Uh, but among the results, we can see the service uh, key and the business key. So we know which uh, business entity runs such a service and what is the URI of that business service. And we can use that key to actually get the details about the service. Um, right. So that's the inquiry API. You can use that to search. And uh, we have seen a simple, uh, simple example, but you can make the example more complex by using additional find qualifiers. Um, besides the inquiry API, there is also a publication API. So this one you can use to actually manage records in the registry. So you can save business service binding and key model. You can delete it. Uh, you can get some assertions about publishers and so on. You can also get all uh, the registered information by a specific publisher. Uh, so you can see what a specific business uh, entity has registered in that UDDI registry. Now, uh, regarding uh, those publication services or publication APIs, there is one uh, quite important concept that uh, you will definitely run into when using UDDI in uh, the tutorials. And that is the key generator T model. There's a special kind of T model uh, and it works like this. Basically, whenever you register something in a UDDI registry, a key needs to be assigned to that thing because everything in UDDI has a key. Now, um, the UDDI registry also has a set of users which are allowed or not allowed to do some kinds of operations. Specifically, to be able to create a key within uh, a key partition, you need to be the owner of the key which ends with the key generator string within that partition. If you are not the owner of the key generator key, you cannot create other things with keys within that partition. Specifically, or on examples, it means this. If you want to create um, this key, uh, you need to be the owner of the key generator uh, for, for that key. Uh, if you want to create the key generator key itself, then you can do that. Uh, there is no problem. But again, if you have the, X, the triple X partition here and you want to create a key generator in there, you need to be the owner of the key generator of the uh, partition, which is one above. If you want to create a key like this, you need to be the owner of the key generator key within that partition. Again, if you want to uh, generate a key uh, triple Y in the triple X partition here, you need to be the owner of the key generator within that triple X partition. If you are not the owner of the key generator key, you will not be able to create the key within the partition. So in the tutorial, when you will be asked to actually um, create some um, business uh, or binding templates and business services in UDDI, this is something you will most probably run into. So there you will need to take care of uh, which user uh, you use to create the key generator so that you are then uh, able to uh, add more keys into the registry. Which brings us to um, an example of how you can actually create um, entries in the UDDI registry based on something we already know. When you have a wizard description of a web service and you want to enter that web service or register that web service in a UDDI registry, there is a uh, standardized process <clears throat> of how this is done. You will again see that in the tutorial. But basically, uh, in Wizzle, you'll find a port type, binding port, and service. All those will be represented using T models and entered into the UDDI registry. Then uh, you will have a business service created for, for the service found in Wizzle and a binding template, again, for the service found in, uh, in the Wizzle. And those will be categorized using T models, which come from the binding and port type and so on which will also be created in the registry. This is an automatic and predefined process. So 
uh, as you will see tomorrow, when you take, for instance, the whistle file describing the calculator web service, which we already know, there is a functionality where you point to the whistle file and uh, the whistle file will be processed in this way and all the T models, uh, binding templates, uh, business services will be created in the registry. And then you can use the inquiry API to actually find that uh, registered web service. Um, right. Uh, so as I already mentioned, uh, the UDDIs uh, don't have to, oh, the UDDI instance doesn't have to be alone. There are actually two kinds of instances regard oh, uh, according to the complexity. So you can have a UDDI node with a minimum set of functionality. Uh, and then you can have the entire UDDI registry, which may or may not uh, comprise multiple nodes. Um, then the registries can form so-called affiliated registries, which are still individual registries, but uh, they may, for instance, share some UDDI key partitions and so on. So there can be a whole complex environment uh, built from uh, individual UDDI nodes. And when that is the case, it might, all, might also be the case that you have, for instance, a business service that is registered in one UDDI node, and for some reason, you need to move it to be registered in another UDDI node. There is a special support for that. That's the custody transfer API. In this case, the custody means the ownership of the registration record for some of the uh, things in UDDI. And there is a standardized protocol for how this ownership can be transferred. Basically, it involves creating a transfer token in the source registry and then asking the target registry to transfer some uh, select entities from the uh, source registry and uh, based on this transfer token. And then those two registries communicate using the custody transfer APIs to actually uh, transfer some registrations from one registry to another. Uh, so uh, this is more for, for your information. It's not something very important to what we are going to do. And uh, finally, you can subscribe to get uh, uh, information about changes in the UDDI registry, um, which might be useful if you, for instance, want to monitor if some services uh, of the same kind, of the same technical uh, fingerprint um, spin up somewhere and get registered in the registry, you might want to get notified about that. Um, so there is also support for that in, in UDDI. Okay, other than this, UDDI is just basically a catalog. And uh, what will be, again, more important um, for us is to get uh, our hands on one of those UDDI catalogs implementations. Um, I already mentioned that that will be uh, Apache Judy, uh, J UDDI. We will work with that on the next tutorial uh, tomorrow. So again, this is one of the shorter lectures. Are there any questions regarding UDDI? So in the tutorial, we'll try registering a remote whistle in the UDDI registry. And then the main part of the tutorial will be basically making your web service register in the UDDI, web uh, UDDI registry when it starts up and deregister itself from the UDDI registry when it shuts down. This allows basically clients to find your web service dynamically uh, during runtime. If there are no more questions, 